Yes, as, as Chris said, um, I, uh, I study this uh, dynamics of antiviral resistance, and I should add to the title uh, for, for HIV. I mean, uh, most of the stuff that I'm, I'm going to talk here uh, applies for oral, uh, other uh, vital diseases, but uh, uh, basically uh, the results here, the direct results, are, are just for the epidemic of, of uh, HIV. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, different from what you would expect in, 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 uh, in several aspects uh, from, the, from the epidemic of antibiotic uh, resistance, which uh, Chris mentioned. Uh, bacteria is, uh, is, 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 uh, are very messy organisms, so, so I'm working with the easy stuff. So, so at least uh, now, now, you, now you know. So uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, some, some work that I've been doing for the last uh, few years. Uh, in the, there are some traditional mathematics, and there, there are some other stuff as well, so, so, so don't, don't leave the room just yet. Right, so first, I should start with defining drug resistance. I mean, in general, drug resistance is just the ability of the virus to, uh, to replicate in the presence of drugs. Very simple definition. Uh, in the case of HIV, I mean, the, the, this virus replicates very fast, uh, and it's a very simple virus, a small virus, and it doesn't have any uh, proofreading mechanisms, uh, which uh, means that, I mean, it's going to make mistakes from time to time, and the virus is not going detect to uh, detect them, and, and sometimes it's going to produce uh, mutant strains that are going to be resistant to the, to the drugs. Right now, uh, this is a this is a problem with HIV because you know it's, it's been uh, it's been found that uh, in a, in a good percentage of, of patients that receive uh, treatment this uh, antiviral uh, therapy, the, the treatment doesn't work, and in 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 a good proportion of them, uh, it, it is because of uh, uh, of uh, of these resistant strains. Okay. Uh, now that's not the only reason why treatment doesn't work, but but that's that's another story. Uh huh. The mechanism is just because it's a retrovirus, or the, are all of them like that, or it's there's something special about it. Mm, no, I, I think it has to do with the simplicity of the virus. I don't think it's it's, uh, it's just because of. of of being a retrovirus, yes, yes. I mean, you, you'll find drug resistance in, in other viruses as well, uh, of, of different kinds, like, you know, more common things like influenza, for instance. Um, now, several statistics why this is an important, an important issue, especially, especially because we know that these resistant uh, strains can be transmitted. So if a person is infected with one of these, uh, of this, these strains, uh, they could uh, uh, propagate this, this, uh, this virus you know, among the rest of the population. And, and I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's expected to have some sort of sub-epidemic of these resistant, uh, these resistant strains. Uh, of course, we know that, and it makes a lot of sense, that the percentages of, of this uh, transmitted drug resistance a, is uh, higher in those places where, where there is a higher coverage of, of the therapy. I mean, if more people receive treatment, uh, I mean, you, you put more pressure on the virus, so, so you, you'll see more resistant viruses, right? So it makes sense. Uh, now, the mechanism, as I said before, is, is very simple. I mean, as simple as a single base mutation, right? So I, I'm not going to uh, mention much about this, but I mean, yes, yes, believe me that the, the mechanism is simple. So the model that I'm going to show you is, is, is simple as well, so in, in, in that sense, at least. Now, uh, resistance, I mean, I'm talking about drug resistance, but drug resistance is very specific. I mean, in the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to say drug resistance strains, uh, meaning just one, one group. But, but in reality, we have a, a very uh, a, a good amount of uh, subgroups between, between those. Uh, because I mean, it's, 
the resistance is very drug specific, right? So we have mutation classes. There are several examples depending on, on the drug we are looking at. Uh, but these this have been identified. These are very well known. So, so we could tell just from uh, looking at the sequence if there is, if we are looking at a resistance strain or not. Uh, now, the story of resistance. So back in the late 80s, uh, we, we saw this first antiretroviral. It was used. Uh, it was the only one available. Uh, and it was, I mean, it, well, don't worry much about the graph, uh, but uh, it, it, was, uh, is, it was effective only for the first few months in, when, when we, it was uh, given, and then uh, we, we lost all the effectiveness. And the reason was because of drug resistance, right? At the time, uh, of course, people weren't expecting that, uh, but they realized uh, after, after some time. Uh, now, not, uh, not much long after that, uh, mathematicians, uh, physicists, and, and so on, started looking at, at this as a dynamic problem, of course, start uh, proposing models to, to study this. And the models are relatively simple. I mean, we use yes, a compartmental model to, to try to describe this in terms of the, of the cells that are involved in the process of, of the infection. Uh, for HIV, the, the main target cells are CD4 cells, which are cells of the immune system, which is one of the reasons why HIV is, is such a, represents such a problem. Um, now, the, pro, the, the models uh, started getting a, a bit more complex, just a bit. For instance, uh, the, the viral population was, was modeled uh, explicitly. Several questions were asked like uh, what's the rate of uh, the emerging of these resistant strains, like comparing probability of, of pre-existent drug resistance versus uh, de novo drug resistance, new, new resistance. Uh, people, people studied, for instance, suboptimal therapy, what, what happens if uh, the patients uh, skip doses, for instance, or, or were not given the, the proper dose that they, they receive. Uh, eventually, we got into this, and we tried to study the role of, of the backward mutation rate, which is uh, the mutation that happens in the opposite direction to what generates drug resistance. I mean, from, from a drug-resistant strain uh, or a drug-resistant strain mutating to a drug-sensitive strain, right? Uh, now, in, in, in the problem of drug resistance, uh, you, you would expect that that is not that important, right? But, but you, you'll, see, uh, uh, you'll see soon enough, uh, it provides certain mechanism that might be relevant in our situation. So as before, the model is simple. We just add the background mutation rate. Uh, we consider treatment, as, as most authors do. We consider a fitness, co fitness cost on, because of the drug resistance. That's, that's uh, well known. So the model looks something like this. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, just, uh, just see that uh, the that, uh, mutation process is, is just a very simple rate, uh, you know, cells jumping between the two classes. Now, with this simple model, of course, as expected, uh, we see that the dominant strain is replaced when, when the antiretroviral therapy is, is present, right? If there is no uh, ART, then we see the the drug sensitive virus, you know, to be the dominant one. But if ART is present, we see the opposite. Now the drug resistance strain is, is dominant, right? I mean, very, very, very respectable result. Uh, now, I guess that the interesting thing here is that, again, it's, it's not very surprising, but, but these uh, backward mutations, right, actually provide uh, a mechanism for the persistence of the drug sensitive strain, right? So if we stop giving the, the drug therapy, then we'll see that the drug sensitive strain will, will reappear uh, very soon after that, that uh, uh, happened. So, it, so it's a simple mechanism, right? It, it's not very surprisingly, but this is actually that, uh, um, I mean, several studies uh, don't, don't pay my, my, much attention about it. So, so, so we consider that of course, it depends on the context, 
right? It depends on the question that we're asking, but something that we shouldn't just uh, forget about it. So, and, and we see, uh, I mean, these backward mutations uh, are, are really present. We see, we see them, for instance, uh, in, in clinical studies where they have followed people, patients infected with, with uh, HIV, uh, infected with uh, drug resistant strains from, from the beginning, transmitted drug resistance, uh, and that haven't received treatment for, for the first uh, a few months, uh, uh, yeah, well, 100 months, years, right? Um, and then what we see is that this drug resistance strain, because of the fitness cost you know, of, of, of the resistance, uh, these resistance strains are eventually replaced by a drug sensitive state, uh, strain, which is uh, fitted, okay? So, so we see that, I mean, in this case, uh, this, this, uh, these people classify uh, those, uh, you know, like survival probabilities for, for the different mutation classes. And, uh, and, and, and in particular, we see that there are clear differences between, between the mutation classes, right? Now, to begin with, this is proof that the, the back mutation, the backward mutation uh, are, are really there. Right? That's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but also, we tried to use this data to, to actually give an estimate of the drug resist of the backward mutation rate. Right? So that's what we, we did next. Uh, so what we did is, was to define a score, uh, just to say how good is, is our, well, our model or simulation you, you'll see in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, comparing that to compare that to the data, right? Uh, uh, this is just based on distance. We try several things, but actually, this is based on confidence intervals, right? Of the of the survival, which I showed you before. Uh, but we could do this in, in in many ways. We try different things. Uh, I'm, I'm just mentioning that one. And what we did was uh, to write an stochastic version of the model I showed you before, removing the the forward mutations. Right? We, we look at the forward mutations because we don't have, I mean, they, they are occurring, but we don't have uh, treatment. So that means that those resistance strains are not going to be selected uh, for. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't, we don't look at forward mutation rates, yeah, uh, rates. So yes, the backward mutation. Uh, and, and of course, for the, for the stochastic model, stochastic in, 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 you know, in, in the context of a, of a Markov chain, uh, we define the events, the transition probabilities, and, and so on. We ran several simulations for this. And what we did was, for each simulation we run, uh, we look at the time where uh, the resistance train was replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, well, either that or, or if uh, replacement, uh, never, replacement never happened, right? I mean, for, at least for the duration of the... Uh, uh, of the clinical data we had, yes, yes. So, so we did this a bunch of times. Eventually, we, we got a, a, a simulated survival curve, which is the one we compared to, to the data, right? And then this was done for, for each parameter combination, and then that way we at least get an idea of what those parameters should be or around what values, right? So we did that. For each of the uh, uh, drug mutation classes, uh, and uh, so I mean, uh, here of, of course this is a, a, a you know a, an approximation of the contour plot or a contour plot in, in a very low definition scale, uh, and the darker the color, the more likely that the parameter would be the right one for. For for for, uh, for case, so the details are not that important. I, I guess that the main thing is that we could see clear differences from certain drug classes or mutation classes to some or, or, other stuff, right? I mean, uh, in general, what we see is that there is a close relation. Here we we were uh, looking at in particular two parameters: the relative fitness of the virus and the mutation rate, and we see that as we increase the the, well, kind of, if we increase the mutation rate, I guess this looks better, 
uh, we need to increase the relative fitness. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we could uh, get uh, uh, several interpretations. But anyways, now we, we, we move on and we wanted to study now the epidemic of drug resistant strains. And these resistant strains uh, were propagated uh, among a population, right? So, so we asked uh, several questions, like which factors would favor the, the emergence and the persistence of drug resistance in the population? Uh, thinking, for instance, on the timing when the, the therapy starts, uh, what's the, the, the ART uh, coverage and so on, and also how the, the viral dynamics that, the, that, that happen within a, an infected host uh, would affect uh, the overall population dynamics, right? So, so we were thinking about that. Uh, and we follow uh, two approaches. Well, actually, uh, as usual, I mean, there are several approaches, but I'm mentioning the ones that actually work. So two approaches, two main approaches. Uh, the first one is based on a nested uh, or semi-nested model, I should say. I, I will give details in a, in a, in a moment where we combine the within host dynamics with the between host dynamics in the, in the whole population. Now, the second approach is, uh, is a kind of weird combination of an stochastic model with Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see in a bit. Right, so first, the, the nested model. So again, we're thinking in, in, in the epidemic of, of HIV. Uh, we, we started with one of the simplest models, we, we think of the population as a homogeneous population, um, random contacts, basically. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and also using a compartmental model, but, here is the but, uh, we use a non-constant transmission rate, okay? So, so this framework is, is being used before in, in, for HIV and for other diseases, so it's not, it's not new. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is because we know, ah, sorry, I'll, I'll tell you why we are doing this in a second. But first, uh, then following this idea, of course, we don't have only susceptible individuals and infected individuals. We also have uh, different kind of infected individuals. If those are infected with the resistant strain or the sensitive strain, if those, res uh, I mean, in either group, they, if they are receiving uh, therapy or not, oh, the other way around, if they are receiving therapy or not. Uh, and in the case of uh, sensitive, drug sensitive strain uh, infections, if the ART is either uh, successful or, or not. Okay, so again, I mean, what, what we would expect in, in, uh, in, in this kind of, of, uh, of situation. Now the difference, of course, uh, is that we are using a non-constant transmission rate, and that constant transmission, a non-constant transmission rate, uh, was chosen because we know that the viral load actually determines the the between host transmission rate and the infectious period, right? So, so this this is work that that has been done before. Uh, this comes from from cl clinical data, uh, and, and there are several. Uh, uh, groups, research groups that have uh, reported this. So, so we actually have uh, a function that relates, uh, I should say here, uh, the set point viral load with the transmission rate during the, the uh, asymptomatic period. I'll, I'll give you details in a second. Uh, and also we have an explicit function that determines the, the duration of that asymptomatic period uh, as a function of the of the viral load, uh, of course, uh, as we I guess as we would expect, the transmission rate uh, increases with viral load, but the asymptomatic uh, period uh, decreases with uh, viral load. Right. So now, uh, what do we do with this viral load? How how do we determine it? So here is where we use the virus uh, the virus dynamics inside a, an individual host. Uh, and we go back to, to the model I showed you before, right? I mean, the, the simple within host model. And, and, but, but basically, we, we consider two, two different situations. 
Uh, one, when uh, we start treatment and the treatment doesn't work and, and we get uh, you know, drug resistant uh, strains of the virus. Uh, and on the other hand, when we, uh, and we, when we have a successful treatment, right? And in that case, I assume that uh, once we start the treatment, the viral load starts you know, going down until it's, uh, well, it, it doesn't disappear, I mean, but, but it's pretty much uh, zero. And, and we get this from, from the model yet without, I mean, when, when we remove the, the resistant uh, part, right? So it's so a very, very simple uh, thing to do. Now, uh, another thing that we have to, to uh, pay attention is that uh, the transmission rate in, for HIV uh, depends on the stage of the infection. I mean, this, this has been reported before. Uh, HIV has three clear uh, infection stages. Actually, you can, even if you look at, uh, you know, these genetic diagrams, right? You, you'll see it from here. Uh, in the uh, red, uh, in the red curve, you have the viral load, and you see that there is an initial stage, which is called the, the acute stage, where, where basically you have uh, exponential growth at the beginning, and then it, uh, the viral load decreases. So viral load is quite high here. Uh, and then... And then in the asymptomatic period, you see, or also called clinical latency, you see that the viral load doesn't change much, right? And finally, you have the AIDS uh, stage, where again, the virus goes, goes up. Uh, now, this looks similar to what I showed you here, but actually, but actually these stages of infection are not explained by, just by viral load. So it's not enough to just look at the vital curves or the vital loads. And, and then uh, decide what the transmission rate is. So, so there is actually shown that the transmission rate in the acute phase is much higher than in the asymptomatic uh, period. Okay? So, so we take this into account, right? So we, we put together the viral dynamics, I mean, with the, the, the function we had for the transmission rate uh, as a function of viral load, uh, together with these uh, different stages of, of infection. So, so you have different weights for each. For each, uh, for each stage. Sorry? Uh huh. Uh, the eighth, eighth stage. Yes, the eighth stage. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that could, could be explained, uh, perhaps, because people are too sick to, 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 con to contact other people. Um. I don't, I don't remember all the details uh, of this study, but I think that has been taken that has been taken into account. This actually, are like transmission events that had happened in that in that period. So people are not that bad. Actually, here I think this is the stage where people are really really sick that they don't have any context. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's what they're showing there. But uh, yeah. Right, so, so putting all these ideas uh, together, what we get is uh, basically three possibilities for the, for the transmission rate, right? So if we get a, a, an infection with a drug-sensitive strain and we don't give any treatment, then we'll see something like this, let's say, right? We see you know, the acute phase over there. Uh, we, we see the uh, eighth stage over there and we see the uh, asymptomatic stage over there, right? Uh, however, if we have uh, the, the drug, that treatment is given and, and drug resistance emerges, then we see this uh, green one, this, this green transmission rate. Uh, at the beginning, is the same. At the time of treatment, it, it looks like it's going to work, but, I mean, it's, it's only for, for, for uh, a short time. And after that, the drug resistant uh, strain appears, takes over, uh, the infection lasts longer because, uh, because of the fitness, fitness cost, the viral load is smaller, right? So the transmission is, is, uh, is smaller as well, and the duration is longer, okay? So, so we would expect some change there. Uh, and the third case is that uh, people receive, the patient receive uh, treatment and the treatment actually works, right? So then we'll see that 
the transmission rate is basically zero, right? So the virus is uh, undetectable, okay? So th this, these are the, the basic uh, three uh, possibilities. And, and what we actually did was to use this as, as the only three possibilities. Well, actually, I, um, here I'm not saying anything about if the, transmi if, the, if the transmission or if the infection started with a drug-resistant strain. And that would be the, you know, the, the extra cases, right? But, but they are similar to this, okay? So, so, I mean, they are just analogous to this. Now, um, so you see that, I mean, I, I'm using this as the, as the transmission rates, and, and these are going to be in general, right? So these are the, the, the functions, right? These are the functions that are going to go, uh, let me go back. Uh, no, actually, I have it in the next one, there. Those are the functions that are going to be here when we, we generate new cases, right? So those are the, the transmission rates. So, so our model at the end looks like, well, we, we, we look at the rate of change of susceptible individuals. We see what happens with the infected individuals, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the infection progresses. And we see how to generate new, new cases depending on, on the type of infection of, from the five classes I showed you before. Okay, now uh, I, I, I told you before that, I mean, this has some resemblance to, to a nested model, but in the, you know, in the strict, uh, strictly speaking, is not a nested model, right? Because uh, those transmission rates are fixed uh, from the beginning. So we are linking the two, the two scales, the within host and the between host, but not in the, you could say, not in the dynamic way, right? So, which is a, a, a subtle but important difference. Now, some results. Uh, so, unsurprisingly, we have that if we uh, increase the therapy, the, the, the ART coverage, the number of cumulative infection, the cumulative number of infection uh, decreases, goes down, right? I mean, here we are, I'm showing you just uh, uh, five different percentages, uh, but they, they go down if uh, there is no drug resistance at all, right? So basically we're saying that the, that the, ter the therapy is, is, is quite su successful. Or uh, we see the same, although, you know, at, at, at a very different scale, if uh, all the treated, uh, treated patients develop drug resistance, right? So, but, but in this case, I mean, the, dr the drug is not doing anything, basically, right? Now, it's very different. It's very different when we have drug resistance. Because if we have drug resistance, what we see is that in some cases, uh, if we increase the ART coverage, again, from zero to 100, uh, we could uh, increase the cumulative number of infections. So we could get more infections, right? So treating people, right, would actually make the, the epidemic uh, bigger, right? Now, you, you, see, you see that here. For instance, for the 100 percentage uh, coverage, uh, uh, you see that this curve in red is above the, the one in yellow and, and, and green, which are lower ART coverages, right? And you see that this is the case when uh, there is a 10 percent chance of of, of uh, developing uh, drug resistance. Now, it is the same in, in, in other cases, like when, uh, when we start the epidemic with just drug resistant strains and, and uh, no one else get drug resistance. We see the same effect. Percentage. This is the, the, the proportion or the percentage of people that, of patients, infected patients that receive uh, the drug. Let's receive the therapy. Yes, this is the what I call here the ART coverage. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, if the drug resistance is present, we could get uh, this kind of anomalies, right? Now, uh, the reason why we we see such a pattern is that uh, when we don't treat all the people, that means that the drug resistant uh, per, sorry, the drug sensitive strain is, is still around. And in some of those cases, the drug is going to be effective, 
treating the, the, the disease, right? So if we don't treat them all, then there is still a chance that we could help a few of those people, right? I mean, new infections, of course, right? I mean, if we don't treat them, then, I mean, directly, they, they're screwed, right? But, but if we wait, and, you know, the next generation, we can treat them. Uh, we can treat those, right? So, so that's uh, where, uh, where we see or what, what generates this, this effect. Okay, so now, ah, well, some, some points to discuss. Uh, the main thing, I mean, th there are several things that we could, uh, we could discuss about this model, but uh, I guess my, my main message is that, I mean, this is a very simple framework, but actually you could do several, stu you, you, several stuff with it. And, and, and this could be extended to, to actually do some other stuff that I, wasn't, I, I, I didn't include here. Now, what we wanted to do is to add some sort of heterogeneity to the population. I mean, we saw before that the virus load was actually quite important for the epidemic because the transmission rate and the asymptomatic period, the infection period, um, they both depended on, on the viral load, right? And what we know is that, let me jump to this one, is that uh, the viral load is not the same. There is no uniform distribution uh, for all the patients that are infected with, with HIV, right? So actually what you see is, uh, what th th these are two, two populations together, uh, but if you look at either color, you see that, uh, I mean, there is a clear, I mean, it, it looks kind of symmetric, it's not symmetric, but, but there is a clear, uh, uh, a clear mode of the, of the distribution, right? So it's, it's not uniform at all. What we see here as well is that for two different populations, two different cohorts, uh, we could have very different distribution of these viral loads, right? So if we are using the viral load to determine the transmission rate and the infection period, uh, so we must better pay attention to, to this sort of stuff, right? I mean, if we want to compare uh, the epidemic between populations or, or even inside uh, yes, a single population. So that's why uh, we try to, to or, or we propose a different, a different approach to this. So, so we take this into account. So what we did, I, I, I said before that I was going to, to mix uh, some sort of a stochastic model with a, a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, I, I don't have a good uh, name for it. If, if you have uh, any suggestion, just yes, uh, let me know. Uh, but um, so what I, what I meant by this is, uh, first, I, I uh, look at new infections or I model a new infections with uh, an stochastic approach, a simple stochastic approach, a mar yes, a Markov chain. Uh, I define my events, I define my probabilities and so on, but just look it at, well, new infections and, and some demographics, okay? So, so what I'm saying is that the susceptible individuals will become infected with uh, the drug sensitive strain or the drug resistant strain. Okay, and, and I mean, this is, this is basically the same as, well, it's, it's, it's the standard stuff. But now, what I'm doing different here is that each individual is going to be different, right? So I'm going, at, at the time of, of each new infected, I mean, once from here, uh, we, we decide that there is a new infection either with either the sensitive or, or the resistant strain. We decide uh, what the transmission rate is going to look like. I mean, the, the overall function for the transmission rate, the transmission rate profile. So, so for each new infection, what we're going to do is sample from the population distribution of viral loads. So we're gonna have a viral load. Uh, we are going to decide if that individual is going to receive uh, therapy or not. And if, if he, she does, uh, then we're going to decide, decide when that's going to start. Uh, same thing for, for the drug resistance. And if, there, if the infection is started with a resistant strain, we, 
we want to, to say, uh, we want to decide as well uh, when the replacement is going to happen if ART is not given, right? So at the end, for each individual, we are going to have an infection profile like, like this for each new uh, infection, okay? Uh, however, we are not using an individual-based model, right? So once we have the transmission profile, the only thing we do is put everything together, you know, to make uh, the, what is called the force of infection. So we are going to, to put together all the transmission uh, rates for, for either the sensitive strain or the resistance strain, right? And that's, if you, if, if you remember, probably not, that's what we need for the stochastic model, right? So that force of infection is this lambda, okay? That's, that's all we need to produce new infections, more new infections, okay? So that's what we're doing. Uh, so that the force of infection, for instance, could, could look something like this, right? I mean, that, that's just one example. So, so as I said before, uh, we sample the, the viral load from the population distribution. We decide, well, of course, for, for each of the population, either one. Uh, we decide what the viral load is. We, we use uh, our, our previous function that we had before uh, to, to produce a transmission rate, an asymptomatic period. Uh, we decide, basically, we, we toss a, a coin to decide if ART is given, right, whether it is given or not. If it is given, we follow the, well, it was current at the time, but uh, the, the current recommendation from the WHO that was uh, to start ART when the amount of immune cells uh, decrease uh, below 350 cells per uh, cubic uh, millimeter. Uh, and, uh, and, and we actually look at some, also some clinical data that, that have found that, or, or that, that shows that uh, the, this time until this uh, cell count is bef below 50, actually depends on the viral load, right? So again, viral load is, is, is in there. Uh, so the data is the, you know, the, the stair plots, and, and what we did was to fit a gamma distribution, yes. I mean, because it's easier to, to work with, right? But, but again, the, the important thing is that uh, that time until we star uh, ART depends on, on viral load. So again, viral load is quite important. Now, uh, we also decide if resistance uh, emerges, again, with those coin, and that timing when that happens, uh, we, we use some, uh, you know, cumulative probability, we define it somehow, uh, but, but informed by, by the within host model. And same thing for the uh, drug resistance replace, uh, replacement time. Uh, but now this is uh, mostly based on, on the clinical data that, that I showed you before. Now, if, they are, if, if drug resistance is, is present, uh, as I mentioned before, there is some uh, fitness cost, right? So at the beginning, we decided the viral load, right? If it is with drug resistance, then we have to take into account this fitness cost. So we are going to uh, reduce that viral load because of, of, of resistance, right? And then from there, uh, we can get the transmission rate, right? I mean, it's just going to be lower transmission and longer infection, okay? So putting, putting all this together, uh, we get this kind of transmission profiles, right? I mean, these, these are just examples, I mean, how, how they might look like. Uh, for instance, if we start an infection with a drug-sensitive strain and ART is given at some point and it's actually successful, then transmission rate basically goes to zero. But if uh, we do the same, but now the emergence of drug resistance, uh, there's going to be some waiting period, and then we're going to see the resistance strain, okay? And, and, and so on for the other cases. I, again, not all the cases are here, but yes, yes, examples. Uh, so, yeah, so some, some, you know, some, some results that that, that uh, will show you how how this works. Uh, so, for instance, if we look at the prevalence uh, on top and cumulative infections uh, for each of the of the two cohorts, uh, without without drugs and without drug resistance we see something like this. I mean, we see that, well, the prevalence uh, is, uh, is higher at the beginning for the uh, Zambian cohort, uh, 
because uh, the viral loads were higher for, for that cohort. Uh, and you see the effect also in the cumulative infections. You get more infections because of that, right? Uh, okay. And however, if we have uh, ART, I mean, if all the patients receive treatment, then, well, to begin with, we, we basically saw the epidemic, right? Because we're assuming that there is no drug resistance, so the treatment is effective and, and so on. Uh, so we don't see much difference between the two costs. Uh, and, and, uh, and I mean, here it doesn't matter that the Zambian cohort is, has uh, higher viral loads because when we give treatment, because of the higher viral loads, we're actually given the treatment earlier, right? So you see that. So you see that here. So, so there is a balance between the two. Okay. So again, not, not really unexpected. However, if we have now drug resistance, now there is a, a clearer or, or bigger difference between the two cohorts, right? And we can tell that this difference is because of uh, drug resistance. I mean, if you look at the force of infection from the drug-sensitive strain, uh, you don't see much difference between the two cohorts, but if you look at the force of infection for the resistance strain, now you see a bit of a difference, right? So now this, this is for the, these two cohorts, but we could ask uh, several questions, right? So I'll, I'll show you some examples of different uh, questions you can, you can answer with this approach. For instance, what happened when we increased the, or we changed the, 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 the coverage, uh, the ART coverage? Uh, so as before, so let's look at the cumulative infections here. So you see that the red curve, which corresponds to everybody receiving treatment, goes you know, above the, the case where only 75% of the people receive uh, treatment, right? Why? Same reason as before, right? And again, we see that the, the reason is, is because of drug resistance, right? So, so we see the effect of growth resistance. We could, we could do more stuff. For instance, uh, how do uh, all these mutation classes compare, right? And in this case, I'm only looking at the replacement times because there, 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 are, there, there are other stuff uh, going on as well. Um, but again, we see things like, for instance, for, for this mutation class, uh, the cumulative number of infections is, is a bit slower, uh, uh, smaller than for, for the other two. And, and we see the, uh, uh, the difference here in the, in the drug resistance uh, infectiousness, right? So again, drug resistance is in there. And uh, finally, we could look at the effect of the relative fits of the resistance strain, and we see that this is actually quite important, right? So if we have a relative fitness of anything, basically anything less than, than 0.7, uh, the, the epidemic would, would actually stop. I mean, the, the, the therapy would work. It doesn't matter that you have a resistance strain, right? So it has, this resistance strain to do something has to perform at least at some level, right? So there's a minimum performance level that is required. Again, not, not, uh, not that unexpected, but, but still interesting to see, to see the numbers. So again, uh, I guess this shows you that, well, that the viral load is important. So if we're looking at viral load, we lo have to look at the heterogeneity of the viral load, I mean, because we, we will see some changes, some effect of that. And uh, as, as before, and as you know, we normally like to, to finish uh, this kind of tax, uh, this is a simple uh, modeling framework, but, but is, or, or looks quite, quite useful. I mean, we could answer or try to answer several, several questions. Some stuff that uh, we are now working on, for instance, uh, how can we evaluate uh, this uh, so-called aggressive therapy, which, which recommends to start treatment as soon as possible, right? Which, is, which hasn't been the, the, the recommendation from you know, WHO or, or so on. Um, for instance, we could also uh, try to evaluate how to use uh, drug resistance tests. Uh, these are tests, clinical tests, that, that are given to patients before recommending treatment. So if, if they identify uh, a resistant strain, then they don't give uh, uh, a drug that is, uh, that is not going to work, right? I mean, 
looks like the, the sort of stuff that we should be doing, but that's not the case. So, so with this framework, we could try to evaluate the effectiveness of, of the thing. Uh, we could evaluate some other control measures like this uh, pre-exposure uh, exposure, uh, prophylaxis. Um, so to, to, to finish, I mean, there, there is uh, I mean, some, some acknowledgments. Uh, John Kitajinwa was, uh, did, did some of the work I show. Uh, he's, he's a former uh, PhD student of mine. And, and also, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Sebastian Bonhoeffer from the ETH at Zurich and Cesar Terrero, a colleague in, back in Colima. And that's it. Thanks.